Well, we're continuing in uh, the book of Isaiah, and I hope uh, you've been uh, looking at the Bible Project uh, information that was put out on the WhatsApp group. Uh, and what I would recommend uh, doing is just listening to it. It's, uh, it's in two parts. Uh, each part lasts about eight minutes. So if you did one in the morning, one in the evening, that's only 16 minutes in a day just to get familiar with the outline of the book of Isaiah. It's quite a big book, and so it's good to get that overview, and we'll do a little bit about that this morning, but to get an overview of the book so you can see how it is placed. It's one of the most important books in your Bible. So let's read from chapter 1, verses 21 to 26. See how the faithful city has become a prostitute. She once was full of justice, righteousness, used to dwell in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your choice wine is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, partners with thieves. They all love bribes and chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless. The widow's case does not come before them. Therefore, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the mighty one of Israel declares, Ah, I will vent my wrath on my foes and avenge myself on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove your impurities. I will restore your leaders as in days of old, your rulers as at the beginning. Afterwards, you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. May God add his blessing to this, his holy word. Well, uh, a faithless uh, city, uh, and I've entitled it, Our Urgent Need for a New Self. What we see is the faithlessness of our lives uh, before we came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. We were governed by our own impulses, by our own desires, and what we wanted to do with our lives. And it was faithless. We didn't know God. We couldn't see God. Uh, and then came that point where Jesus came into our lives, and we realized that uh, our lives were actually a lot smaller than we thought, and that God is a lot bigger than we realized. And there was an urgent need for a new self, a regenerated self in Christ Jesus. So we're going to be looking at four things this morning. <laughs> a faithless city, a city in ruin, faithless leaders, who are in rebellion, a faithful God who needs us to repent, and a faithful God who offers redemption. Isaiah is a hugely important book, and understanding this gives us a complete picture of the Bible. And it's easy to look at this book and lose heart, and God assures us that his word will never fail. So we need to study his word to allow it to work within us. And I just wanted to do this morning uh, a brief uh, overview of really the first six chapters so that we can place this in context of, of the book itself. And we found in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 4, that God's people had forsaken the Lord and they were worshiping false gods. This is the time of Ahab and Jezebel. And so uh, this was, this was the, hard, the hard-hitting time where Jezebel had led Ahab into sin and uh, had caused a tremendous amount of problems in, in uh, Israel at the time. They'd become as spiritually lifeless, as spiritually lifeless as their idols, and therefore, they must face this coming day of the Lord's judgment. And that was through the Babylonian exile. 
But after the exile, their spirituality didn't improve. Their hard hearts continued, uh, but God had not abandoned them, and he holds out hope of a coming day of salvation. And this is what Isaiah is pointing to, this uh, new exodus led by a promised servant king who will save them through his death as an atonement for the sins of his people. So in short, Isaiah is about the Lord's day of judgment and salvation is coming. And when it does, his glory will be revealed through his anointed servant king. So what you see is sin, the answer to sin, which is the savior, and then the, the new people that are regenerated as his people. And you get that through the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah is a bridge between the Old and the New Testaments. Last time, I think, we spoke about, I spoke about chapters 1 to 39. And it offers us a vantage point before the exile, warning of the judgment of God coming on Judah and on Israel and the surrounding nations. And then from uh, chapters 40 to 66, it's written as if the exile has already happened. We see that the exile does not change the stubborn hearts of God's people, Yet there is, still remains a hope of gospel comfort, which we see in Isaiah 40, verse 1. And that brings about God's promised restoration. It's exciting, isn't it? Because we see that we're sinners, fallen, and then by God's grace, he lifts us up. He gives us a new nature in Christ Jesus, and he restores us like that piece of rope that I was doing at the children's address. It restores us into that right relationship with him. Isn't that a beautiful picture? And Isaiah brings the story of Israel's history while also revealing God's authority against all those opposed to him. It lays the foundation for the New Testament because the Jews in Jesus' time were as awkward and hard-hearted as the Jews in Isaiah's time. And it had those post-exile attitudes. And the gospel also presents the ministry of Jesus as the glorious resolution to the story that began in Isaiah 40. The people were persistently blind and deaf, and God is leading them to this new exodus through the coming of this new faithful and suffering servant. In Christ, we are that new exodus. A new people, a new humanity. And if you don't see that in your life, then there's something going wrong. The old life needs to be put to death to have the new life in Christ come through. If you can't differentiate between what's old and new, there's a problem. We need to be living this new life in Christ Jesus. And of course, this servant, who's not only a covenant for the people, but also a light for the nations, and that's in Isaiah 42, verse 6. The promise to Abraham is fulfilled. All the families of the earth find blessing through faith in Isaiah's servant king. And Isaiah provides this crucial connection between Israel and the revelation of God in Christ. And it's an encouragement to evangelism. The people were deaf and blind back in Isaiah's time. The people were deaf and blind in Jesus' time. And guess what? The people are deaf and blind today. How many times do you go and tell people about Jesus and they go, I don't know, I can't do that. I don't know, I can't see. I don't really want to know. Who is this man, Jesus? Don't tell me about him. They're deaf and they're blind to the truth. And therefore, we should be doing all we can to show them and to tell them of how Christ was crucified, crucified and risen and spread the good news of the gospel to the spiritually blind and deaf. And Isaiah is to expose the vanity of idolatry he has a lot to say about the idols, and it was rife at that time, as it is today. You've only got to go down to the supermarkets and to the shopping centers to see the idolatry that is going on. 
Worshipping blind, deaf, and dumb idols makes us blind, deaf, and dumb. We need to change our viewpoint to see Christ in everything. And we must be very careful we don't worship our own idols, for they will come to nothing. A little exercise for you, get a piece of paper, sit down and work out what are you worshipping? What is filling a large proportion of your week? Where is your thought life? Write it down and you will see how much time are you spending in the Word of God, in prayer, in meditation, and just allowing God to speak into you. If your priorities are different from living this new life in Christ Jesus, then there is something wrong. We're all in a war against our own idols. And I'm not standing here saying I've got it. I'm okay. Because I've got my own idols as well that I need to do battle with and get my priorities right. We can be so easily deceived when it comes to promises of power, wealth, pleasure, and security. We can deceive ourselves. Is your idol in your pension scheme? Is your idol in your property? Is your idol in your bank balance? Is your idol in your job? Is your idol... I could go on. Where are you putting the priority. And Isaiah shows us the glory of the living God. In Isaiah 6, and we can't wait to get to Isaiah 6, but we're going to have to wait because it's going to be Christmas by the time we get there. Alexander's broken this down into almost a verse a week. <laughs> so, so it's going to take us till Christmas together. You know, I think I'll, I'll be in the glory by the time we've finished Isaiah. By the time we get to chapter 66, I'll be buried. <laughs> so I'll be in the glory watching down and thinking, are oh, they just still in it? <laughs> in Isaiah 6, we read about this absolutely wonderful, magnificent encounter that he has with holy God. And he's utterly undone by his sin and yet purified and forgiven when that coal from the altar touches his lips. Here is the glory of God revealed. And we see him as a living God who speaks and saves. The glory of God is revealed through a human king. This king which is born of a virgin, and we're going to be looking at that at Christmas, is both spirit-anointed Davidic king and a spirit-anointed servant but he's more than merely a human king. He's called Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Did you hear the chorus of people shouting that out? Emmanuel means? It's getting better. <laughs> we could go one more go. Should, should we go one more go? What does Emmanuel say? God with us. Yeah! <laughs> I love it. <laughs> God with us. Though people are blinded by their sinful idolatry and in bondage, the servant opens the eyes of the blind and delivers the captives from prison. And you get that in Isaiah 42, verse 7. This servant accomplishes this work by offering up his own life, being pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Where do you read that? Isaiah 53. Our peace with God and the forgiveness comes through the servant's sacrifice. Do we see this? We encounter the glory of God in the same way Isaiah did, by coming to see our own uncleanliness and trusting in the atoning work of the servant to take away our guilt. How exciting is that for you this morning? To realize that your righteousness was but filthy rags before the Lord. That's Isaiah 62, I think. It's, our righteousness is but filthy rags before the Lord. But through him, we can be cleansed to be used by him as vessels 
meet for the master's use, prepared for all good work, we can be used by God because of his cleansing us from our sins. Now, if you're not excited this morning just on that one fact, you did. (laughs) You know, there must be an hallelujah in there somewhere. I mean, it's just so exciting to know that we've been cleansed from our sins and we've been made right with God. You see how that knot just slipped away and left the cord intact at one with God. Isn't that wonderful? Well, I'm excited anyway. Isaiah began his vision in chapter one by uh, reviewing God's charge against Judah for their sins against him. God even condemned the practice he had prescribed, including the sacrifice and the celebration of the feasts. He saw these practices were external not internal. They were going through the motions. Are you going through the motions? Are you, are you going through the motions? <laughs> Who's having a motion? <laughs> right, you're going through the motions. Right, you're going through the motions because it's external, not internal. God looks on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. He can see right into your heart what you're thinking right now. No, that's Rod. Not, <laughs> so, but see, God knows. And you know, it, it's worth sitting down and just doing a check-in with God. I would strongly recommend this. Sit down with God and check in and allow him to reveal your inner heart to you. Be ready for it because it's not pretty but it's the best thing you could ever do because what it does is it drives you to your knees and seek repentance and forgiveness. People had become numb to their sin, so they felt that as long as they were religious, then everything was just fine between them and God. Don't fall into that trap of coming to church and sitting here dead in your sin, bereft of a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you remember way back, I can't remember that far back, but you remember way back you had a relationship with Jesus. It was exciting. It was vibrant. You were on fire for the Lord. It was really, really exciting. And you said, oh, show me some water and I'll walk on it. You know, it was that sort of relationship that you had with Jesus. But it's grown dim. It's grown dark. It's a distant memory. You can't even remember what it was that sparked that relationship. And you find that you are sitting here this morning thinking, when will he shut up? so I can go for my lunch. (laughs) I'm watching you. (laughs) I'm working it out who's thinking that. (laughs) I'm not going to point. God did not want their religion. He did not want their religion. He wants your heart. Your heart. He wants your heart. He wants that relationship with you and he wants us to turn from our sins so as we look at these verses ask God to open us to his spirit to show us areas in our relationship with him which are based more on doing than on being this is one of the biggest dangers we face is the doing. And we think we're right with God because we're doing. But we're not being. God wants us to be before we can do. And in fact, we can't do until we are being. Get it? That's so important for us to realize 
It's our relationship of being in him and him in us that enables him to use us to serve him in the doing. If we go off doing without being, then it's wood, hay, and stubble. It all gets burnt up. It's a waste of time. Now, an illustration. You like this one. Right, pin your ears back. <laughs> the rebellion of a teenage daughter or son was breaking mother's heart or even grandmother's heart. The struggle reached its peak when the young girl was arrested for drunk driving. After posting bail for her daughter, the two didn't speak until the next afternoon. They came together and the woman handed her daughter a small wrapped gift. The girl flippantly opened it and was exasperated by what she saw. The box contained a small rock. She rolled her eyes and asked, what's this for? Because she came from Scotland. Her mother simply replied, read the card. She did and was overcome by the words inside. Tears began to stream down her cheeks as she reached out to embrace her mom. The card said, this rock is more than 6,000 years old. That's how long it will take before I give up on you. God broke through to us with his unrelenting and enduring love. God will not give up on us. And we're not to give up on each other. This rock is more than 6,000 years old. That's how long it will, be, it will take before I give up on you. We have an urgent need to be a new self. And so this is where the sermon starts. The faithful or faithless city in ruin, point one. <laughs> Redemption isn't about us redeeming ourselves, but it's about God's work to bring us back to himself. Redemption is the how of God's salvation. It's only through Jesus that we can have our sins forgiven. He pays the price since we can't. If we send our way into helplessness, we can be redeemed by God. And that's the best news we can ever hear. Even if we have sinned our way into helplessness, God is there to redeem us. We just need to turn to him. Verse 21, we see how a faithful city has become a harlot, a prostitute, a whore. And then in verse 27, I will restore you. Verse 27, I will restore you. Isn't that marvelous to hear that news that God will restore us? Now that's hope. There is justice and then righteousness. What a contrast. A city that had become polluted by sin, formerly devoted to the one and true living God. You can imagine Solomon's temple, a place of worship where God was, and then they have turned to be unfaithful, pursuing idols and false gods and murderers. The former glory was now in the gutter. Idolatry had led to a total breakdown of social and moral standards, which led to social injustice. If idolatry in any form is allowed to go unchecked, it always manifests itself in a breakdown of the moral fabric of our society. It did in ancient Judah, and it's doing the same in Scotland today. There is only one solution to social dev devaluation, and it is spiritual revolution. I'm going to read that again because you need to get it. There is only one solution to social devaluation. That's what's happening in Scotland today. And it's spiritual revolution. 
It's when the born again revive and the Spirit of God flows out of them that changes our society. Because where we're going just now is down the gutter. We're just like Judah. We're just like Israel. It's idol worship and God is being bypassed. They don't want to hear about God and yet God is the solution. And do you know where it starts? It starts here. It starts here. Spiritual revolution, a spiritual revival. Isaiah sees the wickedness of sin and God's judgment, but also God's offer of repentance that would lead to redemption. And then we've got the faithless leaders. My goodness, you might as well be reading this in the daily record. Faithless leaders in rebellion. Have you ever considered sin is a pollutant? Our world is preoccupied with pollution and speculation about global warming, and yet it's blind to the most prevalent pollution on the planet, personal sin. Nobody wants to hear about personal sin or take responsibility for personal sin. And it says in Isaiah, your silver has become dross, your drink diluted with water. And it speaks of the worthlessness Silver can contain some alloy and still be silver, but if it's become dross, it is completely worthless. This is what sin will do to a person. Pure wine with water added is no longer pure. And it's just a picture of the effects of sin which contaminate, contaminate every part of a person. Their leaders are rebellious. Those who do their own plan, but not God's a stubborn people who love a bribe. I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. You don't have to go far, do you, to find that within our own parliament. This seems like a running commentary on our politicians. If we've lost our standards, then it just becomes an auction to the highest bidder. When powerful people lose their sense of God, they become savage to win no matter the cost. But who's picking up the bill? It's us. We're picking up the bill. 14 million pounds on credit card for uh, ex expenses. We see the ruined city and a rebellious people. And then the contrast in verse 24, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, he is our only hope. And then in verse, and, uh, point three, faithful God, the need to repent. The faithful city is a picture of the church. This is about the gospel, a faithful city wedded to God by grace through a covenant. The church is the bride of Christ. And when we flirt with idols, we're committing adultery. Verses 21 to 26 are a lament. Something beautiful has been made dirty. And in the Sermon on the Mount, we read and we've looked at that, the salt, that we're to be the salt of the earth. But if it loses its flavor, it's good for nothing. Just dirt to be trampled underfoot. We're here to give people a taste of God. And how well are we doing that? That wasn't a rhetorical question. <laughs> How well are we doing that? Not well. When the church doesn't do that, then God laments. When we're unfaithful to God, it corrodes the bonds that hold us together. The wonderful thing about God is no matter what, God will never go away. He will never stop being God. And you need to hear that this morning. God is God and he does not change. God is eternally unchanging and committed to himself, and that is our hope. And remember, nobody is getting away with anything. We all have to give an account at the last day. Every one of us. You can't hide it. You can't pretend. It's all exposed. You do something about it when there's time. Don't leave it until the last minute. You can't put things right, right at that last moment. And you don't know when the last moment's going to be. So put it right today. 
when we look at the sin and depravity in verses 21 and tw- to 23, what we're expecting next. When he's, when he's actually looking at the depravity, rulers are rebels, silvers become dross, they don't defend the fatherless, the widow's case does not come before them, they don't care about the orphans, it's all about themselves. What can they make out of it? So what are we expecting? Is it total annihilation? Well, we wouldn't expect anything less, would we? Just annihilate the whole lot, clear it out, start again. Complete annihilation. That's what would be expected. But what happens? Redemption, verse 26. I will restore your leaders. How can we be restored? God Almighty, the lover of people, resolves to purge and cleanse. He will no longer simply punish. He will take away the men who had been his adversaries and his enemies from the midst of his people, thoroughly purging away the dross and taking away all the sin. And then in verse 26, we've got faithful God, redemption offered. I will restore your leaders as in the days of old, your rulers as at the beginning. After you you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. This is a prophecy which has not yet been fulfilled. Uh, So it's the ultimate fulfillment looks to the future when Christ will return triumphant over his enemies. This marks the termination of this present age which is brought about to close by the second coming of the Messiah at the end of Daniel's 70th week. In in Daniel's 70th week, it's split into two, three and a half and three and a half. It's three and a half years, and then there's the great tribulation and the final three and a half years. And this this is called the great tribulation. After Judah's 70 year exile in Babylon, there was a partial restoration, but God's promise in this verse looks forward to complete and permanent restoration of God's people, Israel. And then it says, after that, you will be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. After what? After the return of Messiah who defeats the Antichrist and establishes a millennial kingdom and reigns on earth from Jerusalem. Then and only then will Jerusalem be truly righteous, a faithful city available to those whom the king now reigns by grace through faith. That's us, folks. We are the new exodus, a chosen people plucked from the bondage of sin, a new humanity to be followers of Jesus Christ, no longer faithless and in rebellion, but through repentance have been restored by the redemption through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what does that mean to us today? Live the life that he has given us. He doesn't want our religion. He wants our hearts. It's time for a spiritual revolution, and it starts right here, right now, with us. Are you in for it? Well, that wasn't the response I was expecting. (laughs) We're talking about a spiritual revolution. A spiritual, this is revolution speak, yeah? Have you seen it on the telly when when they're in revolt and they all go, and we're going to go, we're going to burn down the house, and everybody goes, ah! And I say, we're in for a spiritual revolution. Hmm, yes, hmm. Uh, (laughs) Right, well... Right, we'll have another shot at it. It's time for a spiritual revolution. Are we in for it? (laughs) Right, let's pray. (laughs) Lord and Heavenly Father, we can't have a spiritual revolution without the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we would ask that you would incite in us that revival of our own souls, that we would be serious about these words that you've given us today, that we wouldn't be a faithless ruin that we wouldn't be in revolt, but we would repent and be redeemed and know that we belong to you. We're this new humanity. We're this new exodus that you're going to use to your glory to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to a world that is deaf and blind. And Lord, you will save the ones you want to save, but you'll use us in that process. 
And so, Lord, may we join in this spiritual revolution that you are starting. And may we continue it so that people come to know and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us this day, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.